Now let us hear God's word. Our reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Let us read from the 24th chapter of Luke's Gospel and beginning in verse 13. Now behold, two of them were travelling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things that happened there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us, When they did not find his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things? And to enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven and those who were there with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed. Amen. My message this morning is taken from the passage that we read, and I'm sure we're uh, very familiar with this account of these two disciples on the Lord's Day, uh, walking uh, the seven miles from Jerusalem to the village of Emmaus and uh, feeling uh, very uh, dejected because uh, the one in whom they had put all their trust as uh, Messiah had been put to death and even though uh, some of the women had been to the tomb that morning and found it to be empty and said even that he was risen, uh, they are all uh, in uh, states and it's as they're uh, walking and I can't imagine them walking very fast uh, to Emmaus because they are uh, so down Uh, I'm imagining them now shuffling their feet and just talking about this one subject uh, how uh, Jesus of Nazareth uh, had claimed to be the Messiah and now all their hopes were dashed and it's it's a very uh, sad uh, scene and this is why I want us to consider it Uh, the Lord draws near and everything changes now having been in a minister's conference uh, uh, I've uh, had to listen to uh, uh, a number of discussions on what we need to do in order uh, to 
change the situation that uh, we are in. Uh, we don't need to uh, have a degree in theology to realise uh, that, uh, spiritually speaking, uh, things uh, are bad in our land. I'm not just thinking now of the tide of immorality that has swept over us, but the spiritual atmosphere is heavy, is it not? And uh, when you go to certain parts of the world where uh, there is a movement of the spirits, there is a charged spiritual atmosphere. And coming back here, it's like coming uh, to uh, a fog spiritually. And uh, people uh, try to persuade themselves that everything is going all right, that we all need to be encouraged. But like these two, uh, eventually we come to the place where we realise Th- things are pretty depressing when you think about the evangelical world, about the silly things that are going on, and about the future. What's going to happen? Few people are being saved, and even of those that are saved, there are few men being called to the ministry. There are some, thank God, but even when men are called, there are some strange things happening. Now, This is my burden, really. Uh, One thing, we need the Lord to visit us. Just as the Lord Jesus drew near to these two on the road to Emmaus and changed them from being depressed disciples into being those at the end of our reading who couldn't help but run back to Jerusalem to say that the Lord is risen. Uh, So we need not new ideas. Now, There is a place, of course, for doing things. We mustn't be passive. Uh, There is a poem about a sailing vessel stuck in the doldrums and about people making all sorts of suggestions as to what can get it out of the doldrums. Some say to the captain, we need a fresh coat of paint. Others say we need to rearrange the deck chairs. Now, there's nothing wrong with those things in and of themselves. But... It's very wrong if we think that those things will take us forward spiritually. And in this poem, the captain is getting very, very frustrated. And he's saying, pray for the wind. That's what we need. The wind of the spirits. The Lord visiting his people. Now then, what happens when he does that? We must remember Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today and forever. When you get to know a person... There are certain traits uh, that are there. And when we think of the perfect Son of God, then those traits are never going to change. And so when the Lord draws near, there are certain things that are always going to be experienced. Now, you may say, it was all right for these two. Uh, They had the physical presence of Jesus Christ with them. If he was to come to us now, physically, then I'm sure we would all get very encouraged and we would leave this place running and leaping for joy. But look at the way he deals with them. He doesn't say, look, it's me. Just one thing before we look at the lessons here. Before he actually starts saying anything, all he does is get them to talk. Did you notice that in the reading? Uh, He said to them, verse 19, What things? They say to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Have you not known the things which happened there in these days? Before that, he asked them, "Uh, Why are you so sad? What's wrong with you? And then he gets them to open up. Now, that's important. I'll never forget, starting my first pastorate, I was fresh out of Bible college, London Theological Seminary, I thought I had all the answers. And uh, poor, uh, elderly, godly, spiritual uh, members had to endure uh, a pompous uh, young pastor doing all the talking. Now, as you uh, get more experience of the ministry and of the Christian life, I'm sure, you learn that listening is the hardest and the most important thing to do. And Jesus Christ here, he allows them to talk he listens and then he comes in and this is where we need to start looking 
at this account. What true then when the Lord draws near? How did he deal with these two? How will he deal with us? Well, the first lesson is this. He takes us to the scriptures. Do you want to meet again with the Savior? Where do I find him? That's what Job asked. Oh, that I might know where I might find him. Here, in the book. Uh, That is why he didn't say to them, look, it's me, I'm risen, touch me. They they didn't recognize him at first. What he did was take them to the word. Verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures. Now, they had only the Old Testament. We've got the complete canon of the Bible. What a privilege. So we shouldn't think of this as a textbook. There are so many study Bibles available today, and some of them are very good. But you wonder sometimes whether we've lost the plot because it's the word we need. It's food for our souls, this. I've never been able to go that often to posh restaurants being a pastor, uh, but when you do go, you don't get much on your plates. It's all put out in a very nice way, but it doesn't feed you. And it's a bit like that going uh, to some churches today. The sermon is word perfect. Everything looks so spectacular, but your souls are left famished. It's much better to have a good, solid meal. And that's what the word is given for. It's manna to our souls. So this is where we go to. And then, what are we about today? The Lord has given us a day uh, to uh, give ourselves to his things. The Puritans used to call the Lord's Day the market day of the souls. And then we've got a meeting like this. I don't like the word service. We use the word, but our forefathers used the word meeting. And they used to call the chapels meeting houses. Not because we're meeting one another, but because it's possible to meet with the Lord. And we can pray, Lord, visit us on thy day. Visit thy house. Uh, Another word for what we're about this morning is means of grace. That doesn't mean that grace is communicated through these means, as if uh, going through uh, the motions makes us merit God's grace. But these are the things that God uses to meet with us. Uh, They are the vehicles. The word is the car of the Holy Spirit. So that's the first thing. But... Look at how he does it. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I like that. Spurgeon, he used to use this illustration. Just as all roads will eventually take you to London, the metropolis, so all verses in the Bible will bring you to Jesus Christ. Now, some roads will take you there quicker than others. The M4 is quicker than the A40. And in the Bible, some parts, like the Gospels, will be more direct. Others, like Ezekiel, maybe, or Leviticus, will take longer. But eventually, Jesus Christ is the destination. He's the key that unlocks the scripture as I quoted in the prayer beyond the sacred page we seek the Lord do we desire this morning uh, to have a sight of the saviour as we're sitting under his word I've preached in some churches and they'll have a notice um, in the pulpit a verse and it will say sir we desire to see Jesus. The Apostle Paul said, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. And then, something else about this person, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Wouldn't you have loved being there? 
sitting under his ministry, not drawing attention to himself physically, but spiritually taking them to the scriptures and opening up the word and feeding them with this spiritual manna. But it is something especially about himself. He puts it like this, verse 26, Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? What's he referring to there? The cross, the crucifixion, that's the crux of the truth according to Jesus Christ. So it's not just preaching the glorious person of Christ, mighty Christ from time eternal, mighty, he man's nature takes. That's something awesome, but there is something even more wonderful. It is a thing most wonderful, almost too wonderful to be that God should send his own son to die for a child like me, the cross. That's why Paul said, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Do you know why? Because every preacher, every Christian is still a sinner. Uh, We had one speaker in Bala who was exceptionally nervous uh, before having to speak. And one of the younger pastors went up uh, to this person and just listed some of the sins he'd committed that day and reminded this person, remember you are speaking to sinners. That good, isn't it? Richard Baxter said, preach as near to preach again as a dying man to dying men. And what hope is there for us as sinners but this, that Jesus lived and died for me? I've got nothing else to plead before the Lord. I can't plead to my ministry. I can't plead to my good works. I can't plead to my religious duties. All I've got is the fact that Jesus died for sinners and therefore for me. Don't you glory in the cross? Uh, that he is the friend of publicans and sinners, Uh, that we are no longer uh, considered sinners in the sight of a holy God because he has laid all our sins on his own son. It's all about where our eyes are fixed, you know. Either we're looking within, and like these two maybe, we're dragging ourselves down, talking about how bad things are, And then the devil gets in as well and whispers in our ear uh, that we are not true Christians. How can you be a real Christian if you have those thoughts, if your heart is so hard, if you do this and do that? And we can get into a place of utter despair. And what we've got to do is go back to that place where we first went. The cross, where I first saw the lights, where the burden of my heart rolled away. So so this is the first thing he does. He takes them to the Word. We've got the same scriptures this morning. And he shows them himself as Saviour. Oh, that, that we would have a fresh sight of Jesus and of his wondrous love to us. And then what else does he do? Well, the second lesson is this. He rebukes them. We're not supposed to do that today, are we? We're supposed to be encouraging one another all the time. But true encouragement also means rebuking. What does he say? O slow of heart, verse 25, O foolish ones, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken He says, and I'm sure he would have done this in a loving way, where is your faith? You have got it because you were given it. But why aren't you putting it into practice? I've been told that your pastor here is very good with his hands. And uh, he's good at building things. And I once had to to mend uh, uh, something 
and I had to mix um, mortar and it was a ready mix uh, package that I bought and you had to put so much I can't even remember the material now but so much sand say so much water and it all had to be mixed up if it wasn't mixed up right uh, then it wouldn't bind things together we've got the word but this isn't going to do us any good unless it's mixed up with faith are we mixing this morning faith with what we're hearing? That, that, that's what Jesus Christ wants of us. Uh, oh, I, I often feel like the poor man who said to the Saviour, Lord, I do believe, but help thou mine unbelief. Uh, we will never find perfect faith in this world. Even the greatest of Christians will never have had perfect faith. Faith is always going to be mixed with doubts. But this is the essence of faith. Faith isn't something that draws attention to itself. Faith doesn't say, look, I'm strong. Oh, no. Faith says, look, I'm believing in a strong saviour. Hudson Taylor used to say, weak faith in a strong God. That's what we need. And so it doesn't matter if your faith is only the size of a mustard seed this morning. If your eyes are on Christ, so that when Satan tempts you to to despair and tells you of the guilt within. You say, upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. That's faith. And so this is what we've got to do with the word. We've got to take it in. That's faith. Even if it means being honest with the Lord and saying, Lord, I don't feel the power of the word as I should believe. Even if I say, Lord, I'm full of doubts, believe. Williams Pantakellin, the Welsh hymn writer, uh, he did an allegory similar to Pilgrim's Progress, and he defined faith beautifully like this. Excuse the Welsh to begin with, I'll translate it. Credi weld an eisiau. Faith is to see you in need, to see your need. Ath eisiau oll i gyd, yn peri i ti bwyso, ar brynwr mawr y byd. And your sense of need, causing you to lean on Jesus Christ as Saviour. I like that. Faith is to rest. To him that works not, but believes. So if you're feeling down, like these two, if you're weary spiritually, then faith is the best of activities. Because you're saying, in effect, I'm coming to you, Lord, for rest. I can't find it anywhere else. Jesus, lover of my soul, don't, don't you love the spiritual honesty of that hymn. Let me to thy bosom fly, while the nearer waters roll, while the tempest still is high. Hide me, O oh my Saviour, hide, till the storms of life be past. Safe into the haven guide, O oh, receive my soul at last. Other refuge have I none. And listen to this. Hangs my helpless soul on thee. By the skin of my teeth, I'm still hanging. Are you? And when you come to see that however feeble my hold may be, the grip of Christ's grace is much stronger. There's another Welsh hymn which says, My Rabal Sikravri, the strongest hold is his. So that, that's the second thing. We, we need to mix faith. Can I put it even as strongly as this? That I believe in everybody taking part in our services. Now, don't worry, we don't have people coming up in the heath uh, to sing a solo. Uh, we don't have people in a band or anything like that. What I mean is this, that when the word is being preached, it's not just one man that is taking part, but as a congregation, we're all involved because we're to exercise faith in the word of God. And actually, when you have people taking part in the front, once the service is over, that's done. But when we actually put into practice what God is saying, we're taking part then out in the world. We're becoming more Christ-like. Now that's what we need. People being moved in the meetings. Now that's my third lesson and my final point. So Christ says, if you want to find me, come to the word. Come to the means of grace. And then in the second place, we're to exercise faith in the word. And then thirdly and most importantly, and I trust you can see what this is. What happens when he draws near? 
This is what I long for. They came to their destination. He'd been talking with them, opening the scriptures to them concerning himself. And then they arrived in Emmaus. What do you think of this? He gave the impression that he was going further. In order that they might ask him to stay with them. I believe there's a truth in that. Like Elijah on Mount Carmel, after the prophets of Baal had failed, Elijah wants to prove, not just to himself, but to all the people, that the Lord is God and will send fire. So what does he do? He goes over and beyond. He not only has the altar built, but he commands water to be poured over it, not just once, but several times, so that it's drenched. And the Savior here gives the impression that he's going further because he wants these disciples to constrain him to stay. You see, my friends, if we really desire the Lord, he will come. If you seek me with all my heart, you will find me, said Jeremiah. And I'm not sure if we've come to that place yet, not in Wales, We've still got too many committees, too many ideas. If the committee meetings started turning into prayer meetings, then maybe we will get there. E.M. Bound said, when we come to the end of ourselves, we begin with God. Have we come there? And so these disciples constraining Jesus to stay, they have bread, he gives thanks, and immediately their eyes are opened, and he disappears. And then they say this, and this is my third point, Verse 32, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? When the Lord visits, yes, the word is there. And yes, we have a responsibility to respond in faith, but this is so important. It's a felt Christ. Was it Whitfield who said that he preached a felt Christ? Somebody wrote the words, can't remember who, true religions, more than notion. Something must be known and felt. When God, by his spirit, comes upon the people, it moves, it moves us. It's not just our hearts being touched, but our whole being is being overwhelmed by the presence of God. And that's what had happened to these two. Note, they don't glory in the feelings. It's as he opened to us the scriptures, the things concerning himself. It was that sight of a crucified Christ and of his love flooding their hearts. That's what caused the warming, if I can put it like that. Uh, I can give you several examples from the history of the church A few weeks ago, it was Wesley Day. Am I allowed to say that in a Reformed Baptist church like this? It was Wesley Day a few Sundays ago. And that day was the anniversary of that time when Wesley, who had just about come to faith, later on he acknowledged he was a Christian, but he lacked assurance. And he went to a meeting in London in Aldersgate Street. And as somebody was reading, not from the word, but from a commentary, Luther's commentary on Romans, not from the main body of the commentary, but from the preface of the commentary. Isn't that encouraging? Somebody reading from the introduction to a commentary on the word. And as that man was reading those words, the spirit came upon Wesley and he described it in this way my heart was strangely warmed and by that word strange he didn't mean odd he meant supernaturally not human this was divine this was God bearing witness the spirit bearing witness with my spirit that I was indeed a child of God when I was up in Bala I I went up Cader Idris have you ever been up Cader Idris the most beautiful mountain in Wales And I wish I knew where on Cader Idris, Christmas Evans, a Baptist preacher, had that experience of the love of God. 
And many of you will know this account in the 19th century. Christmas had imbibed Sandemanianism, which said all you had to do was believe with your head. You didn't need to feel the truth. And after several years of this poor Christmas was like these two. He was dejected and he was travelling on horseback to South Wales over Cadar Idris. And he'd had enough. He got off his horse. He got down on his knees and he said, Lord, I confess I need you. And do you know what happened? He said, the spirit, the love of God in Christ flooded into his soul and icicles spiritually now melted. Oh, that's what we need, my friends, for this felt Christ to be known in our midst. Where two or three are gathered, Jesus is there. He's here this morning. We serve him. We worship him. He has promised never to leave us nor forsake us. But this is what happens when he draws near. There's a sense of his presence. It's as if eternity invades time and everything else is insignificant. There's only one thing that is before our eyes. Oh, what a savior that he died for me. Think of Evan Roberts, another example. All these men were very different men. Wesley, Christmas Evans, Evan Roberts, 1904 revival, mighty instruments of God. He wasn't mighty to begin with. He had to have an experience of the Lord drawing near. And it happened in Blaen Anerch, near Aberporth. He was in a prayer meeting and he was constrained to pray, Lord, bend me. And that's what God did. He came by his spirits upon Evan And you know what melted Evan Roberts' heart? He wasn't thinking about the electricity. He wasn't thinking about any supernatural demonstrations in the sense of speaking in tongues and all those other things. What melted his heart was this. God was commending his love toward me, and I saw nothing in me to commend it. It was the cross, the cross. Oh, This is my longing for our land, that we would hear reports again of the Lord visiting his people. We've got some people in our prayer meeting, they'll pray like this for Sunday, and I like it when they say, Lord, visit the heath this coming Lord's Day. Turn in. Not that he isn't there, but that the sense of his presence can be so palpable that it's more real than even the four walls. Oh, don't you long for that to happen. And then I just need to finish on this. Notice what happens to them. They run, don't they? They they, they, they don't say, well, it's midnight. We can't be going to Jerusalem now. We can't call on them at this time of the night. Oh, my friends, when the Lord draws near... Everything else fades away. Um, I remember hearing of people visiting the Isle of Lewis, even in recent years. And after the Sunday service, people you know, are very quiet in church on Lewis. They don't stay behind at all. But uh, some people from our church were invited round to people's homes after. And they were up all night talking about the Lord and about his dealings with them. Fellowship, it, it causes you to be revived when you're talking about the Lord. And we're no longer bothered about our lunches and about organization and having meetings uh, that have to be cancelled if the Lord draws near. That's all that matters. Because a Sunday then can be such a foretaste of heaven that we don't want to leave the house of God. We don't want to have to do other legitimate things. We just want to relish in his known and felt presence. Well, may, may the Lord, in these confusing times, may he visit us himself. Not send an angel, not a prophet, but may he come himself. And may we, when it happens, say, not unto us, not unto us be the glory, but unto your name, for his name's sake. Amen.